You're listening to episode 163 of Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast. In this broadcast, the faculty of Mid-America discuss theology and cultural issues from a Reformed perspective. I'm Jared Luchibor, Director of Marketing. Thank you for tuning in. Well, in today's episode, the first episode in the year of our Lord, 2023, we have back with us Dr. Alan Strange, professor of church history. He started a series with us last year on the early church. Dr. Strange, thank you for joining me once again. It's good, as always, to be with you, Jared, and all of our listeners. Dr. Strange, last time we were talking about Arius and the aftermath of the Council of Nicaea in 325, and you mentioned, along with Athanasius, these folks called the Cappadocian Fathers. Can you tell us who those gentlemen were? Yeah, that's a, a, an interesting name. They were from the region of Cappadocia in the eastern part of Asia Minor, though I often, when I'm lecturing on this, it'll be around coffee time, and I will say to the to the students, we're going to be talking about the Cappadocian fathers, and some of them get a little bright eye because they think I said something about cappuccino. But these are not <laughs> the cappuccino fathers; they're the Cappadocian fathers, and there are three that comprise this esteemed group. The first and eldest is Basil of Caesarea, and Basil uh, is the brother of Gregory of Nyssa. The, the group is actually Basil, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of Nazianzus. And that last Gregory is often referred to as Gregory the Theologian. And uh, Gregory of Nazianzus uh, is a friend of Basil of Caesarea. So here's the relationship. Basil, his younger brother, Gregory of Nyssa, and Basil's friend, Gregory of Nazianzus. Um, Basil of, Cesi- of Caesarea's dates are 329 to 379, and he's educated at Caesarea, which is in Cappadocia, that part of Asia Minor, uh, also in Constantinople and in Athens. And he was educated in the best pagan and Christian culture of his day. Uh, he becomes an Aramite, which is a desert monk. And he will become very important for the monastics, just as Origen, uh, we talked about a while back, became very influential on monasticism and the monks. Uh, These Cappadocian fathers are going to have that kind of influence as well. Uh, And uh, a desert monk was someone who was particularly uh, ascetic and um, was devoted uh, in their particular practices Uh, very much to the things of the Lord. Um, And he went to school with Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, and um, so they're going to be lifelong friends. Uh, And in 364, he left uh, the seclusion that he was in as a monk uh, and was uh, agreed to become uh, a bishop uh, to defend particularly orthodoxy against the Arian emperor, Valens. You might recall I had said when I talked about Arianism that though it was put down, if you will, at the Council of Nicaea in 325, it didn't go away. Right. It continued to be a problem in the empire, not only with bishops and theologians, but with emperors. Um, and so Basil became the bishop of Caesarea itself uh, in 370. And um, he did a lot. What would you say his primary contributions were? Well, he entered particularly into dispute with an extreme Aryan party. I mentioned last time some parties, and I didn't really say what they believed, but the the Animoeans and the Homoeans. There was a part of this Animoean party which really stressed the differences between the father and the son— Uh, This party also, uh, one of the parts of this party, was something called the Pneumatomachy. Uh, The Pneumatomachy, as Animoeans, were were deniers of the deity of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. We haven't spoken distinctly about that. Mm -hmm. When we talked about Nicaea, what it focused on was the fact that the Father and the Son are of the same substance, Mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit... Uh, was not as directly addressed there. And so in the course of this time, 
there were those then who began to say about the Holy Spirit to testify and confess contrary to what the, what the Word of God said. And he became, Basil became a great defender of the deity, the full deity of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I have here in my hands uh, his little masterwork. It's not a huge work, but it's the first distinct work on the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's titled here, On the Holy Spirit by St. Basil the Great. He's sometimes called mm-hmm. that. And it's something that our listeners, uh, is, it's, uh, it's not a big book in terms of size, and it's just uh, about 120 pages. It's something that you could easily pick up and read, and I think would could be quite encouraging. Um, in addition to being very eloquent uh, and possessing great learning and administrative talent, he had great administrative talent uh, as a bishop, though he always preferred, you know, it was sort of like I'm doing this bishop thing. I would really rather still be a desert monk, mm-hmm. you know, pursuing <laughs> that. Um, he had a great concern for the poor. Uh, we're going to see this also, especially with Chrysostom. But he, he had a great concern for the, for the poor, which leaves its mark on, on the diaconate in a measure, we might say, uh, and of course also on Eastern monasticism, as, as we've mentioned. And he was one of those who sought with his fellows, uh, with Gregory of Nyssa, his brother, and Gregory of Nazianzus, his friend, along with Athanasius, to reconcile the Semi-Arians to Nicaea, and he played a big part of that. He was, you could say, a key in the triumph of orthodoxy and the effective end of Arianism that really occurred at the Council of Constantinople. We'll talk about that next. Mm -hmm. But uh, his brother Gregory of Nyssa was a brilliant fellow. Um, He was at first a rhetorician uh, and then became a, a cleric, entering the monastery of his brother, and he became bishop of Nyssa, in 371, he was a valiant defender of the Nicene faith, um, and uh, he carefully distinguished the persons of the Blessed Holy Undivided Trinity, particularly delineating the eternal generation of the Son. Now, Origen had done so, but he really picks that up and deals with that, and also deals with the whole question of what's called perichoresis, that is the interpenetration of the three persons, the mutual interpenetration of the three persons of the Trinity. And he also dealt particularly, too, with the procession of the Holy Spirit. Is it true that Gregory of Nyssa, though, might have had some problematic teachings? Yeah, he was, Gregory, and you see this throughout the history of the church, was one of these, he was especially brilliant. uh, And he was, as some are, who are this way in the history of the church, he became a bit speculative. And so there was, a, there was a lot of philosophical speculation, not just, you know, sticking to the Bible, so to speak. And one of the things he likely also picked up from Origen, though it's not nearly as clear in him as it is in Origen, is a doctrine called apocatastasis. Mm-hmm. And there's a mouthful. Right. <laughs> but apocatastasis basically means it's a description of a universalism in which the entire creation is ultimately redeemed, even the devil. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, Michael McClyman has an excellent book just published in recent years called The Devil's Redemption, and it's two volumes. And he deals with this whole question of universalism. And I mention this because it's a big question today, Jared. Correct. Many of our churches and I mean our churches, Reformed and Presbyterian churches, are facing questions from parishioners about this because it's understandable that there's an appeal to the notion that everybody ultimately gets saved and nobody goes to hell. Uh, There's maybe a part of all of us that would like that to be true in some measure, but this is not according to the revelation of God. Mm -hmm. And of course, McClyman particularly shows in this book how this really, if you adopt this position, it really evacuates grace of all of its meaning. Mm. And of course, he says, rightly, it takes away all all evangelistic zeal. I mean, we're called to preach the gospel to all creatures so that they might hear and live. So that's just a little something there for our friends. Now, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, the the friend uh, really of both Basil and Gregory of Nyssa, comes into the picture here 
uh, because he becomes uh, he becomes ultimately the bishop of Constantinople during the Council of Constantinople. Mm. So you have the the brothers who are in who are in uh, Asia Minor, and of course, if you all have a map in your mind, Constantinople, Byzantium, you know where that is. And let me say this: Gregory had himself only reluctantly become a priest. He preferred the contemplative life. And, and just to tie this in for our listeners, not that John Calvin was going into a monastery as such uh, because he had gotten the Protestant memo, but John Calvin, you may all know, was on his way to Strasbourg when he stopped in Geneva, and he was going to Strasbourg to lead there a contemplative life of a scholar. He was retiring. He wanted to do research and writing. Uh, he wasn't interested in the hubbub of active church service. So you, this is not an uncommon sort of thing. So Gregory of Nazianzus was thrust into this, and he particularly is seen as a really powerful preacher. And his powerful preaching is seen as a key in the triumph of the Nicene position. Well, as we consider this portion of church history, Dr. Strange, what are some good secondary sources for ancient church history that you could share with our listeners? I've been uh, sort of promising here and there in the previous talks, Jared. Uh, I've teased a little bit and mentioned this, so thanks for asking. I think we do need to take a pause here and talk a little bit about resources. There's so much I could say here. But let me just say, if um, our listeners are interested in a, a history of just this period, uh, there's a, a, a great little work uh, by Henry Chadwick in the Penguin History of the Church series uh, on the early church. It's called The Early Church. And it does get into the issues. It's over 300 pages. If you're interested more particularly in the doctrine of the early church, maybe you're interested in historical theology particularly, there's an excellent book by J.N.D. Kelly. Uh, Kelly is one of the great early church historians, and he has a book called Early Christian Doctrines, which Mm -hmm. still remains a really excellent book. Some of you may be familiar with Philip Schaff's eight-volume set, and I often get asked the question, is that worth it? Yes, Philip Schaff knew more church, forgot more church history than most of us would ever know. And there are things, if you're really into more detail, there are things uh, in this set that you won't quite find easily anywhere else. For example, I have in my hand the second volume uh, of his set, which is from 100 to 325. And he's talking about a lot of things. And when he's talking about, uh, oh, around Cyprian and so forth, he talks, for example, about church discipline. And he tells you exactly how they did church discipline in the early church, and it was nothing to sneeze at. You can Hmm. see a couple of things. They may have, could have understood grace a bit better, (laughs) we might say. But they, uh, you were, you were in this process for two or three years. Uh, There were those. The first class was called the weepers, and then the hearers, and then the kneelers, and then the standers. Oh wow! Uh, This is. Uh, so you would weep at the door of the church or you would kneel during or you know you would just hear the service uh, the kneelers would attend the public prayer in a kneeling posture and the standards would take place in the whole worship but they were still excluded from communion the worship service was two parts in the ancient church the liturgy of the word was the first part and the liturgy of the upper room that's how they denominated it was the second and only those who were professing believers were in the second part. Catechumens were not in that second part. Mm -hmm. And so, but for our listeners who were saying, well, you know, strange, I appreciate it. Is there something a little shorter and just comprehensive? Oh, there are many things like that. But I think Harry Bohr, B-O-E-R, his short history of the early church, published by Erdman's, which they've kept in publication for some time, it's less than 200 pages. And it covers really all the territory in a, in a general and basic way that we're covering in these talks. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, Bohr's history of the church might be also something of interest to you. And I hope this is helpful 
uh, to all of our listeners. Thank you, Dr. Strange, for sharing those with us. Well, next time, we're going to take a stab at that first council in Constantinople that's going to address this continuing problem of Arianism. For more podcast episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Be sure to search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reformed Seminaries Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.